If you follow me on Instagram, you may have seen this little rant. So, rear wheels shouldn't wobble back and forth like that. Nor should the bottom bracket. This bike was purchased over the summer. These are the bottom bracket bearings, cup and cone, completely destroyed on the drive side. Every so often, I come across something that just sets me off. Recently, a friend of mine fell on hard times. He needed a means of transportation, so he bought this bike, a Kent Flexor 29 from Walmart. And after a few months of light use, the bike was in need of maintenance. So I offered to take a look at the bike and give it a tune-up. Now first off, this is not a Walmart bike upgrade video, but rather a cautionary tale on what to look for when shopping for a bike. Because many of the bikes you find at a big box retailer these days are barely a bike. Some like to call them bike-shaped objects. Sure, they have two wheels and roll, but that's about it. Any regular use, let alone hard riding, makes these bikes maintenance headaches. And often, people just stop riding them, and they end up at the garbage dump. It's become such an issue that a group of bike mechanics, bike co-ops, and advocacy groups have begun a campaign to try and convince bike manufacturers to build these bottom-end bikes to a higher standard. After all, bikes aren't new technology. In fact, Bikes in one form or another have been around for over 200 years. The derailleur has been around for 85 years. It's not hard to build a durable bike on the cheap. But in the pursuit of higher profit margins, we're presented with a slew of sketchy bikes that would barely survive 90 hours of use. The worst of these offenders are marketed as mountain bikes. Once in a while, consumers are thrown a bone and you get some serviceable bikes like the Schwinn Axum or the Mongoose Ardor. There are a bunch of YouTube channels that specialize in upgrading these bikes. And in many cases, they're upgrading a large number of the parts on these bikes. And that's great. It makes for good entertainment. And for those of you that own those bikes, you get to see them upgraded and tested before plopping down your hard-earned cash. When you add the fact that these more serviceable bikes are already priced like entry-level bike shop bikes, the value proposition diminishes. Now this is not a knock on any enthusiasts or YouTubers that find enjoyment in doing this. This is a niche and people enjoy souping up Walmart bikes. At one point in my life, I was gonna do the same thing. This Mongoose Spear was a project I was gonna work on back in 2006, but I got sidetracked. While there are a few enthusiasts that do this, most people that buy bikes from big box retailers are not enthusiasts. They're not mechanics or YouTubers. Most, like my friend, just need something to ride. And the big box store is the most obvious place to buy one. After all, a bike is a bike, right? Well, let's go back to my friend's bike and see if that is the case. This Kent Flexor sells for $200 at Walmart and it's been around for a few years. So I imagine it's a good seller. Your $200 gets you a 42 pound bike equipped with a 3x7 drivetrain with the only name brand parts being a Shimano flat face derailleur and micro shift grip shifters that connect to a Sunrun freewheel. Not to be confused with Sun Race, this ultra cheap freewheel is obscure to the point that I couldn't find a tool to remove it. Not even Park Tool has one. The suspension fork, and I use the term loosely, well, remember the fork on the Mongoose PT26? This one is worse. It's the worst thing I've ever seen. It's even worse than the one that was on the Mongoose PT26. The rear shock would rattle badly if you didn't preload the hell out of it. And even then, you can't get all the rattling to stop completely. The cranks are made of steel that is so bad that they coat it with plastic. The pedal threads on this one were cross-threaded, so I replaced them with a new set of Shimano Altus cranks. One of Shimano's cheapest cranks, and it's still a huge upgrade for this bike. Of course, that wasn't before I had to repair the blown-up bottom bracket, which was improperly assembled from the factory. 
After fixing it up, I took it for a 12 mile pavement ride with my buddy Chris, who's riding his 22 pound carbon gravel rig. The first thing I noticed is the tall standover height. This is a 1990s style frame, but with 29 inch wheels, which didn't exist back then. So maybe it's for taller riders, right? Well, no. The next thing I noticed is how cramped Ooh. the riding position felt. <laughs> <laughs> I spent the whole ride in an uncomfortable, Seriously, crunched I, position I that like left me with sore and achy shoulders and back. I measured the reach at 390 millimeters, which is the equivalent to a size small or even extra small on most modern mountain bikes. The advertised weight of this bike is 42 pounds, and I felt every ounce of it on the climbs. But I shouldn't be surprised, since that hydroformed aluminum-looking frame is actually made of steel. Steel is not real in this case. The weight doesn't help the handling either. The wheels flex badly, as does the fork. The suspension provides no value other than adding weight. The bike basically combines the disadvantages of 29-inch wheels with a bike that's too small in the cockpit and too tall in the saddle and has the weight of an e-bike with a dead battery. A geometry only a Tyrannosaurus Rex would appreciate. At $200, this bike is a terrible value. For a little bit more money, there are reputable brands available at local bike shops or online that will perform better and last longer. This Polygon Cascade, for example, is currently on sale for $399 and spec with name brand parts and is easily upgradable, and it has a lifetime warranty on the frame. Or this bike I found on Jensen USA, on sale for $299 again with significantly better spec and features than the Flexor and bikes like it. I'll leave links to a few better options in the description. And if you must buy a department store bike on a budget, or any cheap bike for that matter, here are some tips to ensure you get something that will be functional. Making cheap bikes requires cutting corners on quality of materials and quality control in production. The more complex the design, the more potential failure points you add. Grab a hardtail with a threadless headset. Avoid anything with a quill stem, like the plague. Here's how you identify a quill stem. A quill stem is screwed into the head tube and has an interface that looks like this. It's an old system that's not as strong and upgrade forks are non-existent today. And guess what? The Flexor has a quill stem. A threadless headset is easier to work on, stronger, and a more common standard on reputable bikes. It's not hard to produce bikes with threadless headsets. Next, make sure the bike has a derailleur hanger and that you can get a replacement. A replaceable hanger is pointless if you can't easily get a replacement. If you don't know what a derailleur hanger is, it's designed to break off in a crash, which protects the frame from getting damaged. Lastly, find a model that is actually offered in different sizes. This is probably the hardest thing to find at a big box retailer. Having a properly sized bike can make a world of difference in your enjoyment. But sadly, these are rare at big box retailers. And when you do find one, guess what? They cost a lot more than $200. And with that, a mountain bike from a reputable brand becomes a viable alternative. There's a saying that goes, buy quality, buy once and cry once. Buy cheap and buy twice. Because in the end, you'll spend the money anyway. I hope you enjoyed this leg of my journey. Thanks for watching.